historic day. Welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Greg Jennett with you from the nation's capital here on Ngunnawal Country and very shortly Fran will. In fact, I think she's with us now, Fran. Welcome once again. Yeah, on Gadigal land, thanks, Greg. Yeah, good to and, uh, see you. It's a bit of a rush today, but we know Well, that. yeah, no, we just had a few uh, technical problems there, but it's all good right stuff. now. It's pretty clear, Greg, isn't it, that, that uh, Scott Morrison intends to spend the final days of this election campaign pushing his policy to let first home buyers dip into their superannuation that he announced on Sunday. He was doing exactly that in Darwin today, just as he did in Brisbane yesterday, heading straight to a new housing estate in the top end, betting that aspirational voters will like the idea of accessing their super... Or for, or for a deposit on a home loan. Yeah, he did that, Fran, and at the same time he rejected the idea which was raised on this program by Penny Wong yesterday that his super home buyers scheme might represent a risky gamble, uh, Penny Wong's word, on people's retirement savings. Now, as we go to air today, the Prime Minister is making his way to another corner of the country, yet to be revealed, while Anthony Albanese is flying east from Perth after announcing yet another round of promises to support local manufacturing. The opposition leader is beginning his day in Perth, speaking to a business breakfast. We will be releasing our costings. On uh, Thursday uh, or on Thursday? On? Yeah, nice to meet you too. So this is, is this is the regular game, is it? Yeah, it's every Tuesday morning. But hang on, hang on. You don't get the first question. Our costings will be out on, on Thursday. <laughs> I can't stress to Australians how important responsible economic management, understanding the economy... You've got to keep your cards close to your chest. ...understanding how to manage money... You've got to know when to follow. And when to follow. <laughs> has such a big impact on you and your family. No one can walk away. I don't think it's a gamble to buy your own home. I think it's the smartest thing that you and your family can do. No way to run. A gamble? The most important investment you make in your entire life as a family is owning your own home. Young people coming through, and, and some will be coming just dreaming. The Labor Party, they hate this. They want big union funds to control your money. You have a trillion dollars of debt. You had $70 billion expended by this government. There is no way, not a hope in hell, that deficits won't be higher under Labor. You have an $80 billion deficit at the moment. He should actually today admit that Labor will run higher deficits and higher debt. We've been fiscally responsible in all of, all of the statements that we've made. That's why this is so important. You've got to know what you're talking about and you've got to understand how the economy works. Oh, there we go. There we go. That's a bit better. If our senior public servants, yeah, and they're paid well, if they can't find $2.7 billion out of a budget of 327.3. Well, I've got a lot more confidence in it. Let's get real here. Let's get real. The difference really is not so much in the savings, it's the fact that we have made sure that our policies live within our savings envelope. We'll unveil our, 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 our plans on, on Thursday. Thanks very much, and now Mark's going to... Thanks very much. Any questions for me? Yep. Higher or lower than the coalition? We've asked now over two days, ten questions. Can you give us an answer? I don't want to disappoint you for Thursday. No, well, you've got an opportunity yeah, to be know, honest with the Australian people. We will, and we will put it out on Thursday. So Thanks, will you also brother. sign up to a treaty with the WHO uh, on yeah, the pandemic yeah. management? Can you answer honestly about that? Is there a problem with transparency here, Mr Albanese? Is there a problem with transparency, Mr Albanese? And you're now just not giving it. You have to answer eventually. You have to answer eventually, and he will. Politicians don't like it, Greg, when they want to be talking about something else. He wanted to be talking about manufacturing policy today and said he was being pushed on costings. But speaking of manufacturing, you're going to be joined by the Shadow Industry Minister, Ed Husick, and I'm going to be speaking to Jim Stanford from the Centre for Future Work, talking about manufacturing policy. But 
The truth is, the fact is, Greg, we've reached that stage of the campaign where almost all of the goodies are out there now, leaving only the final tally of what they cost and what Nazis will be needed to pay for them. The coalition went first today. The cost of its new policies announced since the start of this election came in at around $2.3 billion, and uh, that was going to be paid for, they said, by $3.3 billion worth of cuts to the public sector. Then it was back to pointing the finger at Labor, demanding to know when the opposition will reduce its costings. It happened every election campaign, Greg, this debate over where are your costings, Labor is holding out even as the pressure mounts. Well, you almost could have set your clock by this play. It's kicking in on Tuesday. Uh, the answer to the when question for Labor, though, Fran, is very precise. That is Thursday. We'll go through the significance of why Jim Chalmers and others have selected that day in just a moment, perhaps. But on the figures we have at the moment, both sides are eyeing off public services service spending as a target for savings of around $3 billion, a bit over, a bit under in one case. The bigger question is, though, Fran, where would that leave accumulated deficits over the next four years? Well, for the Coalition, it's $223 billion across all four. And for Labor, well, we'll know the answer to that soon enough. Why has Labor not put forward these policies for costings? Why? There is, no re there is no reason other than they do not want to be subject to scrutiny. We know they will spend more. We know they will tax more. We know that they will deliver a budget after the next election. But they're not telling the Australian people before they vote what will be in that budget. And we also know from recent experience what Labor will do to fund these increased commitments. They will put in place higher taxes. Well, like you said, Greg, you can set your clock by it. We'll come to yeah. Labor in a second. But, Greg, uh, I just want to make the point the government is hiking the efficiency dividend on the public sector. Labor, on the other hand, has a policy to save money from cutting consultants out. Um, so the government's policy efficiency dividends, another way of saying a cut to the public service of more than $3 billion. It's a fairly common cash cow in the past for both sides of politics. But I just wonder about the Morrison government announcing this now, just as their Liberal senator in the ACT, Zed Sedelja, is coming mm. under heavy political pressure from the independent candidate David Pocock. I mean, Canberra is a public service town after all. Very much so. Um, but back to Labor, the remaining question for them is, will their deficits be larger over the next four years than the Morrison government? And, Greg, why is it waiting till Thursday, two days before Election Day, to give them to us? Well, as nearly as we can tell, Fran, it seems to be historical now, doesn't it? There is a long history of submitting and reconciling the figures on the Thursday, the final Thursday, especially by the party in opposition. The Coalition did it twice. Labor has previously used the Thursday itself. It doesn't have any magical powers, but what it does mean is there's insufficient time for Treasury and Finance Department to run a rule over it and come back with a definitive number. Now, all of this might have mattered, Fran, back in that time when each side was chasing the trophy with the plaque called Fiscal Rectitude emblazoned on it, but that hardly seems as prized these days when gross debt is nudging a trillion dollars. So tr Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers is very much taking his own time, Fran, to reveal his bottom line. That's consistent with the practice that's been established. You know, it's entirely um, unsurprising, uh, entirely consistent with the practice that the government themselves uh, set a precedent for, uh, that we would tally up and release our costings towards the end of the campaign. But what we have done is we've released an economic plan and a budget strategy some weeks ago so people can understand uh, where we're coming from when it comes to the economy. Now, the government's only just released... Uh, most of their costings today in the final week of the campaign in the 2019 election they did it on the Thursday in 2013 and 2010 they did it on the Thursday you know, they desperately want Australians focused on the minutiae of costings being released so that Australians aren't focusing on the cost of living crisis that this government has delivered them courtesy of a decade of attacks on their real wages which is seeing real wages go backwards.
Well, as Fran just touched on a moment ago, Labor's main policy announcement today was an allocation of $1.5 billion from its larger pot of $15 billion. That's called its National Reconstruction Fund. This latest instalment would go to medical manufacturing of products, including medicines, all the way through to simple stuff like protective equipment. Now, Shadow Industry Minister Ed Husick was there with his leader, Anthony Albanese. We spoke to him a few moments ago. Ed Husick, nice to be talking to you from Perth. Part of Labor's long-standing pitch around local manufacturing comes complete with references to trains that don't fit in tunnels, ferries that don't fit under bridges. I'm just wondering, why is this a failure of foreign manufacturing, though, and not a failure of Australian ordering? In other words, doesn't the proposition around local manufacturing ultimately come down to price? I think it comes down to a number of things and one of the, the key things in relation to the terrible mistakes of the New South Wales government was underpinned by a lack of faith in Australian know-how and Australian workers uh, in making a very short-term decision that they would offshore that work, uh, thinking they could make a saving which completely evaporated when they bought trains that couldn't fit on tracks, ferries that couldn't fit under bridges and then had to be retrofitted and all that saving evaporated and the, the inability of the, the state government, the New South Wales Liberals, to make sure that they could keep economic activity here, which would have helped enormously through the lockdowns and the sure. pandemic, uh, shows that short-sightedness. But you couldn't guarantee, could you, under the you know, large sums of money that a Labor government would sink into manufacturing, that other similar mistakes wouldn't be made? I think the combo of things needs to kick in. Obviously, project management is very important, but having a determination to be able to make things here, create jobs and have it close to where the end product needs to go is very important. And the other point, too, that's worth referencing is that a lot of the work that then goes offshore and has to be sent back at this point in time, shipping costs going through the roof, means the dynamic, the cost dynamic has altered phenomenally and it forces us all to rethink post-pandemic. What are the key things we think we can get done here? What are the capabilities that we should strengthen up? And what's important for longer-term economic uh, prosperity in this country? And sure. that's the whole... It, it underpins a lot of what Labor has put to this federal election as policy direction we think will deliver a better future for the country. All right, Ed Husick, so there's more on the table today under the heading of advanced manufacturing and specifically medical manufacturing, medical. about a mm. million dollars. So what products will this see manufactured in Australia? What does this money buy? The, the big thing is this, that uh, we saw through the pandemic a healthy society equals a healthy economy. And that lesson has formed the bedrock of this Labor Medical Manufacturing Fund, $1.5 billion, uh, because as we saw through the pandemic, the things that we needed, particularly when our backs were against the wall from a medical perspective, ventilators, PPE, medicines themselves, really important. And uh, we had these big supply chain vulnerabilities that the government has been told sit there, exist, need to be addressed. They set up programs with a lot of hoopla and then underspent them massively. They ignored Productivity Commission, Department of Industry advice that said that particularly with medicines, pharmaceuticals, PPE, really important to fix. Right. So what we want to do is a number of things. First, we want to be able to back local know-how that exists, particularly with medical manufacturers that are here, that know they can grow, expand and build more jobs and also address those supply chain vulnerabilities yeah. from PPE through to medicines. We also want to use our Buy Australia plan that we have already outlined, using government procurement uh, to drive better industry outcomes, create an industry plan in this space where we can see how the power of government contracts can build local capability and team up with the research and the other work that's being done. Clinical trials, exceptionally important, and being able to see more of that happen 
Those trials, Greg, they come up with the products that have to be manufactured somewhere, and we sure. have a determination to make sure that happens here. OK, so would you restrict this, that money? I'll had... just butt in there, Ed Husey. Would you restrict all this money to local companies only? In other words, uh, would you block out foreign multinationals, particularly in the pharmaceutical space? Look, in, in this space... It's made up of a variety of different companies from both here and overseas that are based in Australia. Uh, obviously, we want to promote local industry outcomes, particularly for Australian industry, but we don't want to be completely closed-minded. The, the end result has to be more being made here in Australia and working with people on it, and that's why I've said the industry plan that we'd like to develop out of our Buy Australia plan on this will be really important to see how we can get everyone to chip in and make a big big difference. Um, we had manufacturers, for example, that were producing rat tests. Remember back in January, you couldn't find a rat test. We had Australian manufacturers producing them, and yet you have more chance if you were in the US or Europe to buy an Australian-made rat test than here. All right, can I take you on to some broader campaign topics on the issue of costings? Anthony Albanese, your leaders told us we have to wait to Thursday. Mm -hmm. We could do rough mm -hmm. calculations ourselves, and I think if we did, it would be inevitable already, wouldn't it, to conclude that deficits under Labor's budgeting would and will be higher than the Coalition's? Well, well I have to pass on that the rough calculations being done should substitute formal costings, but I don't think we... You or I, well, they're PBO costings that, that I think your leader says believe... has been attached to every and... announcement. Oh wow, you can you can give me a bit of a stir in the question, but I can't respond. Sure, <laughs> I go think for it. I'm just making the point. I'm just making the point that uh, you know we want to have formal uh, costings released. We've said uh, through Anthony Albanese that'll happen on Thursday. We did say we wanted to wait until the Coalition did their campaign launch, which they, with a long campaign that they planned, they decided to hold their campaign launch really late. So we wanted to see what they put, and we've still got some announcements to be made as well, and the leader is going to be doing that, uh, no doubt, over the next course of the next 24 hours, and he's got the National Press Club he's appearing at. Scott Morrison is not appearing there, but yes. Al Anthony Albanese will, and he'll take the questions. So that's... And you'll see on Thursday the release of the full costings. Right, but the there is an inevitability. No Do you agree there's an inevitability that your tally is higher than theirs after all said and done on costings, on spending and on saving? You, you can't conceivably ask me that question and ask me to do assumption and supposition here on your program when I just indicated a few moments ago formal costings will be released on Thursday. So we'll wait until then. But I just want to make this point. We can have no... Um, braying from the Coalition about when we release our costings. The Coalition have done exactly the same and importantly, between December and March, they made $70 billion worth of commitments that didn't seem to have any costings or offsets, I should say, attached to them whatsoever. One final one, Ed Husick. Uh, the median price for a home in Blacktown, out in your part of Sydney, yeah. $905,000. Why wouldn't uh, couples or individuals who saved up a good, healthy balance in their super not want to dip into that in order to buy in your lovely part of the world? Because uh, this is a, uh, in terms of what the coalition's put forward and dipping into your super, I mean, this is white anting longer term savings for that, that couple. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, the first time that the coalition opened up the super coffers at the first round of, of lockdowns with the pandemic, we had off the top of my head nearly 30% of people drain completely mm. their superannuation accounts. So where are they going to get their deposit now that that's been drained? And the big thing to note is this. Labor has always re been responsible for the big policy plays that have meant uh, longer-term security for people, Medicare, uh, superannuation, NDIS. We've had that in place, and you've always had the coalition white anders come in and undermine those platforms. Fought so long against Medicare, undermined NDIS, and now in this dopey, irresponsible policy that they've put forward with, with superannuation that not even their own side will subscribe to, and you've already seen doubts expressed either now or in the past, will believe it. And yeah. this is a reflects a deep dislike by the Liberal Party for ordinary working Australians to do better than the age pension. And I'll end on this point. 
You're asking me about costings. You're asking me about fiscal responsibility. Where is the fiscal responsibility in hacking away at an income support system to deal with an ageing Australian society that allows undermining of superannuation and the shifting of that responsibility onto the public purse via age pension? Sure. It doesn't exist anywhere. A dumb idea that costs the country cost ordinary Australians and will do nothing in terms of housing affordability longer term and, finally, will drive up the cost for people in Blacktown as it floods the market with people that are cashed up yeah, uh, like. and, and will be counterproductive in the example you said right at the start of your question. Sure, it looks like an argument that might rage all the way through to Saturday. Ed Husick, thanks again for joining us on Afternoon Briefing. Thanks heaps, Greg. All the best here. have failed to boost really their primary vote which means neither side might find themselves in a position to grab a majority of the seats on Saturday night. The government needs to hold on to all of its seats to govern in its own right to not lose any and Labor has a bigger mountain to climb. It needs seven more seats to form a majority. If either side falls short we're in hung parliament territory. One of those the Morrison government will be looking to to help them hold on to government if it is a hung parliament is the independent member for Mayo. Rebecca Sharkey welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Good afternoon, Fran, from, from Mayo. From Mayo. In the Adelaide Hills. Are you anticipating ending up after Saturday night as a member of a hung parliament? How do you see the likely landscape? Look, we've only... If you look at the probability, we've had two hung parliaments since Federation. I don't think it's very likely. Um, the polls, if you believe the polls, haven't necessarily narrowed. Uh, so I, I don't think there's uh, too much of a chance of a hung parliament. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it, it's been the whole conversation, this whole election, uh, and I think much of that's because we haven't seen a lot from the two major parties this election to sort of take up the media bandwidth. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll be talking about policies if you suddenly find, if the government or the opposition suddenly finds themselves having to negotiate with a swag of independence to form government. Um, you've said already you would want, if you're in this position, a firm written commitment on a range of issues and delivery timelines, importantly. Uh, you've outlined a new condition today. It's around a change to the work test for the age pension. What's your, what's your idea? Why? So, hung parliament or not, I want to take this legislation to the parliament. So, this is on the back of the work that the national seniors uh, have done around allowing pensioners to work. And it's uh, something I've been talking with Ian Henschke a lot and also talking with industry groups in my community, uh, even at the South Australian Dairy Farmers this morning. Um, we have around half a million jobs going begging um, for people who are on the age pension. It is too difficult to have to deal with Centrelink every fortnight to report your earnings. There's too many disincentives for older Australians to work. Uh, and we desperately need them in regional Australia. So, to me, it just makes good sense that we would uh, give that opportunity, a bit, a bit like New Zealand does, um, to older Australians to not lose their pension uh, and contribute to the workforce if they're, if they're still keen to work, you know, potentially part-time. There'd have to be some parameters around it, though. It would only be part-time work. Surely someone doesn't get a pension if they've got a full-time job too. Mm. Well, in New Zealand, uh, they do. I mean, you know, we have an assets test in Australia and I, I'm not proposing that I we see. would, you know, necessarily meddle with that. Um, but we need to find people to do a whole range of work uh, in, in Australia, particularly in regional Australia. I'm thinking of all my agricultural sectors, um, horticulture, um, as I said, dairy this morning, um, but also more broadly the hospitality industry. This is widely supported, uh, this national seniors policy right across Australia. And the thing okay. is, is if, if pensioners are going back into the workforce, you know, even part-time, they'd actually be... Um, putting money into the tax system. So I can't see why the two major parties are not backing in National Seniors' plan. All right. Well, in a hung parliament situation, you might get to push that point. There are a few other policies you've listed as having to be on the table in any written agreement. Let's look at a few of them. Uh, climate, you want higher emissions targets. You back in along the lines of Zali Stegall's private member's bill. Um, a federal in in independent integrity commission, you backing... Um, Helen Haynes's federal ICAC model. You support full implementation of the Aged Care Royal Commission guidelines. On those three issues, isn't Labor closer to your demands than the Morrison government? Yet you've said in the event of a hung parliament you'd likely pledge support to the Morrison government. Why? 
No, well, just to be clear, I haven't said that. What I've said is that it's not a partisan view. I would talk with the government in the first place because they're the incumbent government. Um, and, look, there are a whole range of issues um, that are on my mind, that are on my community's mind. Um, what's what's on offer for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, um, particularly as we know this plan ends during this next parliament, uh, plans for regional Australia, I have... A, a, it would just, for me, be a conversation in the first place. I really don't want to speculate or jump the gun on any of this. And I'm also mindful that Andrew Wilkie um, said that he's rather reticent to, uh, to have any sort of formal discussion with really either of the major parties having been burnt by the Labor Party in the past. Um, what I do know is that if I'm re-elected, just like I have for the last six years, I will always take every piece of legislation on its merits. Um, but I am disappointed really in both of the major parties for, I think, a lack of inspiration and, and aspiration during this whole election coverage. Um, I'm still waiting for something big and exciting to happen and I haven't seen it from either. And, and I know that frustration and you're frustrated about it, always being asked about a hung parliament, but I suppose it's, you know, if, if Labor has the momentum, it's got a big mountain to climb. So could it get seven seats in its own right? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you've said you'd speak to the government of the day first, but what if one party ended up with more seats than the other party? How much of a consideration would that be mm -hmm. in, your, in your decision, your deliberation? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I've been very clear with my community. I would talk with the government first. I have, you know, you, you've mentioned many of the issues that are of concern to me and concern to our community. Um, we haven't seen a federal ICAP, but from Labor, they also haven't put into the parliament um, a private member's bill in the last two terms that I've been in the parliament with respect to a federal ICAC either. So I think, um, you know, it's just the lack of detail from both sides at the moment that's causing so much frustration across okay. the nation. What about, um, and, when you talked uh, about a big idea, an exciting plan, we've got sort of competing policies now from both sides around housing. I noticed that Allegra Spender, who's the uh, independent trying to knock Dave Sharma off in, um, in Wentworth, has said that she doesn't like the Scott Morrisons, you know, being able to access your super for your home deposit scheme because it would push prices up. Do you have a preference? Have you looked at the housing plans? Is this sort of what you're looking for or do you want something else? Mm. Well, I think, I think we've had economists say that both of uh, the proposals would push prices up um, temporarily. What we really need is, is a supply um, policy, and that's what we don't have. We had that under the National Rental Affordability Scheme that was a previous Labor policy that ended prematurely under Tony Abbott. Um, but in my community, I look to the fact that I have, for the first time ever, really quite visible homelessness, and I'm not seeing anything really substantial with respect to homelessness. Older women, the fastest growing group of homeless, um, we have a huge rental issue here uh, in, in my part of regional Australia and I think that that's more broadly felt right across regional Australia. So, uh, you know, I'd like to see some nation building. I'd also like to mm -hmm. see us bring back manufacturing. I can't understand why in South Australia, the home of vehicle manufacturing, we're not making electric vehicles. So I have a, you know, a long list and look, hey, you know, if I don't get the chance to discuss them with either of the major parties on Saturday night. You can be sure I'll be talking about them in the Parliament in the next term if I'm re-elected. Well, we'll see where we end up on Saturday night. Rebecca Sharkey, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Good to be with you. Now, you might have noticed there's been a simmering spat in recent days over how much genuine consultation Scott Morrison had entered into last year with Labor before publicly dropping the strategic bombshell that Australia was joining the US and the UK in a nuclear submarines endeavour. Now, to check his perspective on that and some other campaign matters, particularly in his home state, Victorian Liberal Senator and Chair of Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee James Patterson joins us now from Melbourne. Welcome back, James Patterson. Uh, can I ask you, first of all, as chair of the committee, when did you find out that this deal had been clinched? 
Good afternoon, Greg, and thanks very much for having me. Um, I found out the news when most Australians did, when it was officially announced uh, by the Prime Minister in conjunction with President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson. So if the US wanted, not unreasonably, bipartisan assurances on sharing what is, you know, really its most secret technology, uh, why would it or why was it left until the last day before the public announcement in September. Was that fair? I think we can say with great confidence that the conditions that the United States had for entering into the agreement were obviously met because the deal proceeded. So whatever requirements they asked of the Australian government, whatever assurances they sh sought were provided because otherwise they wouldn't have followed through with the deal and they did. Uh, to the reporting that suggests that uh, there was a requirement to uh, inform Labor many months in advance. The Prime Minister has emphatically denied that that was ever asked by the United States and it wouldn't have made any sense anyway because at that point only the Prime Minister and a handful of core and key ministers were aware of the deal. Yes. Subsequently, the National Security Committee of Cabinet was informed, but the entire Cabinet wasn't informed until much closer to the announcement. It would be utterly absurd to inform the opposition leader and his team before the full elected Cabinet of the Australian Government was informed. Why so, though? I mean, you're obviously reflecting here on levels of trust, but... Outsiders might ask the question, uh, why couldn't there be tightly held trust? I'm not saying five months out. Uh, that is obviously disputed, more, more than disputed, rejected by the Prime Minister, but, but a few weeks out even. Uh, what is it that would prevent Scott Morrison from trying to bring Penny Wong or Anthony Albanese into his confidence at that stage? Well, because it was highly classified and highly sensitive negotiations that, by the very nature of it, couldn't be revealed any more than on a need-to-know basis until it was signed, sealed and delivered. Because, as we saw once it was announced, uh, the French government was very upset and tried to seek to undo it. Obviously, they were uh, a loser of the deal, having uh, had that uh, submarine contract cancelled so that we could proceed with the nuclear-propelled submarines. Yeah. Uh, and, as we saw, um, the Labor Party was briefed the day before and in the hours in the lead-up to the announcement, some details of the announcement were leaked. Now, I'm not suggesting it was necessarily the Labor Party who was responsible for leaking that. We don't know who it was. Well, we, Penny um, Wong shows... definitely denies that, emphatically yeah, denies and, that. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it, it, it definitely was. All I'm saying, Greg, is it demonstrates that when you widen a circle from beyond the core group, uh, inevitably there is risks that it leaked and there were some elements of the package that did leak before the announcement and that shows the inherent risk involved and the importance of keeping it to just that core, trusted, uh, inner circle group yeah. who were dealing with the actual nuts and bolts of the agreement and making sure that it was put in place successfully. I mean, imagine if, uh, in the pursuit of bipartisanship or some other objective, we had briefed people earlier and it had leaked and the deal hadn't proceeded. I mean, sure. this is the most significant uh, security partnership that Australia has entered into since ANZUS 71 years ago. It will be transformative for our ability to defend ourselves yeah. and our shared values and interests in the region. Imagine if it all had have come to naught because it had a leak earlier. No, that would have been a catastrophic disaster. I understand that. I might just get you to imagine that the boot were on the other foot just finally because there's lots of sensitive and important kit that the military will be buying and, and let's just presume you were in opposition. Would you just shrug your shoulders and be as accepting as you are of the circumstances here today if uh, you and the coalition were put in this position by an Albanese government? Yeah, let me say for the record, I hope it's not the case, but if we are in opposition in the future and if a future Labor government is dealing with matters that it deems to be sensitive uh, and cannot be shared more widely, I will totally accept that. That is a prerogative of the government of the day. Only the government of the day is in possession of the full facts and the full sensitivities and has the full briefing from our intelligence community and our Defence Department. And if they deem, for national security or national interest reasons, that it has to be tightly held, I will totally accept that. All right. Costings is the issue of the day in the broader campaign, James Patterson. Uh, we see this efficiency dividend extended across the public service. Might that be at the cost? Might that make Zed Seselja, Senator for the ACT, in a very vulnerable position? 
Zizi Soldier is an outstanding champion for the, a for the ACT. He has delivered uh, record investment and funding to the ACT, uh, amazing facilities, uh, community, sporting, health, education. Um, the ACT is a great place to live because of Zizi Soldier being an effective champion for the ACT. Um, I'm not concerned that a very modest uh, efficiency dividend on the enormous federal public service, which is located not just in the ACT, but all around the country, uh, will have any material effect on either the prosperity of the people of Canberra, who are doing pretty well in the scheme of things, or on Zedja Selger's re-election prospects, because right. it really is very modest and it is a traditional form of saving measures put in place by parties of both persuasions. In fact, when Labor was last in office, they had an efficiency dividend and then they had an extra efficiency dividend on top of the efficiency dividend. At one point, it was 4% a year on many government departments and sure. agencies. So this is not an unusual thing it and is it is not. certainly not something that only one side of politics does. Yeah, OK. And let's take you back to your own home state of Victoria there, James Patterson. Uh, people involved with the Goldstein campaign describe it as shaky at best for retain retention by the Liberal Party. Yet we also hear seats like McEwen being mentioned as a possible Liberal gain. Uh, is that realistic? And is it realistic because you absolutely need to offset potential coalition losses in your state? My assessment is Goldstein is certainly going to be close. Tim Wilson is fighting very hard. He's never taken his community or any vote in it for granted. And I think voters of Goldstein, though, are coming to understand what the risks of electing an independent would be and the dangers of a hung parliament in an uncertain time. I mean, I think it really would weaken us as a country, not strengthen us. In the case of McEwen, I was actually there this morning. Uh, I visited a pre-poll booth with, with Richard Welsh, uh, our candidate, and my sense is he's being very well received there. And uh, even more importantly than Richard being well uh, received, no disrespect to him, is just how badly and how toxically uh, the state government is being received, and in particular the Premier Daniel Andrews. Mm. Uh, many voters uh, expressed their strong disapproval of the state government and a number of the measures it put in place during the pandemic, in particular lockdowns. Uh, it's a peri-urban community and the Mitchell Shire Council uh, was one of those ones which is traditionally considered to be a regional council and yet it was often included in Melbourne's lockdowns. And people are very angry about that. They haven't forgotten about that and I think they'll probably want to send the Labor Party a message on election day mm -hmm. by putting Labor last so that Daniel Andrews understands the depth of the anger there. Well, we'll put it on our list as one to look out for and uh, see whether your uh, vague predictions here might come to pass. James Patterson, thanks again for joining us thanks, on Greg. Afternoon Briefing. Cheers. Anthony Albanese was in Perth today promising a Labor government would grow Australia's manufacturing sector. We need to make more things here, whether it be medical manufacturing, defence industry, transport, uh, whether it be in renewables. All of this is an opportunity for us to strengthen the Australian economy, to create jobs here, to skill up Australians while we are doing it. The start of the pandemic and global shortages of necessities like ventilators and masks, remember that, exposed Australia as a country that didn't make enough of the essential products we needed during the crisis. It also provided an opportunity for a rethink on how Australia's manufacturing sector could and should be revitalised. Dr Jim Stanford is an economist and director of the Australia Institute's Centre for Future Work. Jim Stanford, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Thank you very much, Fran. Uh, Jim, the start of the pandemic exposed the problems in our manufacturing sector. We, we didn't make the products we so desperately needed at the time. It was hard to get the supply from overseas. The ships weren't moving. This was an opportunity for Australia. Did we make the most of it? No, we sure didn't, Fran. Unfortunately, that opportunity has slipped through our fingers. And now, two years later, our manufacturing sector is smaller than it's ever been. In fact, there are fewer people working in manufacturing today than in May 2020 at the worst point of the lockdowns. So, you know, there was a kind of short-lived, uh, you know, bit of rhetoric that came out about how Australia needs to be a country that makes things again. And there was a task force appointed and, you know, a couple of high-profile uh, people appointed to study it. But not much has come of it, unfortunately. Well, surely more than rhetoric, and certainly we've got both sides, major parties this time, really talking a lot about Australia needing to be a country that makes things. We've had uh, Anthony Albanese promising a $1.5 billion medical manufacturing promise today. He was also talking about making trains. His, his 
phrase there, defence, transport and renewables. But the, the government announced its modern manufacturing policy, started off at $1.3 billion, ended at double that. It was to focus on resources, technology, critical minerals processing, food and beverage, medical products, recycling, clean energy, defence and space. They've had a space announcement today. Some things have happened, haven't they? Money has been spent. Well, announcements have been made and committees have been struck and uh, grant applications have been opened. But uh, where the rubber hits the road, Fran, uh, it hasn't happened. Our GDP uh, value added in manufacturing has shrunk. Employment has shrunk, as I've mentioned. Our trade deficit in manufacturers has gotten much wider because we're, we're buying more manufactured goods. Of course, we've seen this big uh, boom in consumer spending uh, since the lockdowns ended, but we aren't making more of it. That can only translate into a, an even bigger trade deficit, close to $200 billion now per year. Okay. Uh, so you know, there has been announcements for sure, but it hasn't really transformed the direction of this industry. Is there a table we can rate ourselves against? How does Australia's self-sufficiency in manufacturing compare to the rest of the OECD? Ouch, that's a, a painful table for us to sit at. We've done research uh, on that, looking at the comparison between how much manufactured output a country produces and how much it uses. And uh, we do not live in a post-industrial economy. We use manufactured goods more than we ever have. But uh, in Australia's case, we only make about two-thirds as much as we use. And that ranks us dead last in all the OECD countries uh, in terms of self-sufficiency. And it's not because we can't do it. It's not because wages are too high or anything like that. Countries like Germany, Sweden, Japan, they all produce more than they use. And, and they manage to do it even with high wages because they're investing in technology and productivity and innovation. We haven't done that. Instead, we've tied our wagon entirely to resource extraction and export. And that leaves us very vulnerable at a moment like the pandemic when global supply chains and world trade are disrupted. Well, I mean, it was a deliberate strategy of the 80s and the 90s, globalisation, free trade agreements, it was all about that. Where do you see the opportunities for Australia to expand our manufacturing industry? We used to have a car industry in this country, for example. Could you ever see, see that return? Do we need to revamp that? Frankly, we could, friend, and it's not just, you know, out of nostalgia for a car industry. The whole global auto manufacturing sector is being turned upside down by a uh, revolution towards uh, electric vehicles that's unfolding much faster than people expected. And manufacturing electric vehicles is quite different than ma manufacturing uh, conventional internal combustion vehicles. Uh, and the corporate structure is different, the technology is different, the economies of scale are different. So given Australia's very, very strong base with uh, uh, lithium and other critical minerals in uh, electric vehicles and batteries and related technology, we absolutely could rebuild a vehicle manufacturing sector. We're already doing buses and, and some other uh, transportation equipment. Um, more obviously and more generally, I think um, adding value to the resources that we're endowed with is the no-brainer. So. Australia is the world's largest exporter of lithium. Unfortunately, we hardly make anything with lithium. Instead, we send the lithium overseas and then buy back all those expensive products that other countries made with our lithium. Is that changing, uh, though? So, I mean, you're uh, keeping, you keep a close eye on this stuff. I, I noticed that, you know, Labor certainly at one point during this election campaign, I think they were in Gladstone talking about uh, investing from their $15 billion manufacturing fund, uh, a batteries hub, to, to do exactly what you said, to use the lithium and the other, those other yeah. metals and, and build our own solar panels. Um, the government was spruiking that there's companies doing that already in Perth. So it is happening. Is, are we just talking scale? There, there are bits and pieces of it happening, Fran, but not nearly enough. So I think directionally, the sorts of policies that you just mentioned, uh, uh, major co-investments, say, between government and private business to develop those technologies, to implement them, to get Australia up to scale, that is the kind of thing that uh, we're going to have to do. And that's the kind of thing that other industrial powerhouses in the world, you know, whether it's Germany or Japan or Korea or even America. In America, they talk free markets, but that isn't how they behave. The government is always in there. Uh, with billions and billions of dollars to leverage uh, investment in new technologies, and the energy revolution is one of the one of the places that America is really uh, building this buy America vision. We have to learn from that instead of just assuming that the private sector will take care of it all for us. Well, you think we might have learned our lessons about the energy revolution by now, Jim Stanford? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, friend. 
Well, Queensland was again the go-to state heading into the final week of campaigning for this election. Scott Morrison was there for the official Liberal launch last weekend. So was Anthony Albanese on Sunday. So let's bring in today's political panel and national senator Matt Canavan joins us now from Moran Bar in the seat of Capricornia, looking very on brand, I might say. And Labor's Anthony Chisholm is in Brisbane. Welcome to both. You are both up for election yourselves in well under a week now, just a few days. Anthony Chisholm, why don't we start with you? Because if there was a repeat of the Labor vote last time around, you wouldn't get back. How are the nerves and why is it going to be different this time around? Thanks, Greg, and thanks for having me on. And I'm feeling quite optimistic uh, about this election campaign for Labor. I think we did learn uh, some important lessons from the last election. I certainly know that through the course of this election campaign over the last three years, I've spent a significant amount of time out on the road. I've, I've been through Moranbar, where uh, Matt is today. I just got back from Townsville. And I get a sense that people are actually just sick and tired of the Morrison government. They're sick of the lies. They're sick, sick of the excuses. Uh, and they're also uh, listening to what the Labor proposition is. So uh, rebuilding manufacturing, that's something that does resonate with Queenslanders. Uh, the threat of insecure work is something that they want tackled, that only the Labor Party will. And also access to uh, a GP service and Medicare and getting bulk billed. That's at crisis point through many parts of regional Queensland. And it's only the Labor Party and an Albanese Labor government that will tackle that. What about a hankering for the vision thing, though, Anthony? I know when I was in Brisbane briefly for, you know, other responsibilities over the weekend, we did attempt to get out and talk to locals and uh, great disillusionment and disengagement, I suppose, would be the summary of the uh, very unscientific uh, survey we conducted there. What is it? I mean, are, are you crunching through that, you're saying, are you? Absolutely. I, I feel very confident in that. And I think that the only party that actually are taking a vision to the country at this election is, la is the Labor Party and Anthony Albanese as leader. And he's outlined that over the last couple of years, but particularly during the election campaign. Uh, tackling climate change and the opportunities that come with that are going to create uh, five out of six jobs uh, will be in regional Australia and regional Queensland will be a big beneficiary of that. Um, we've seen so much happen with the pandemic and the understanding of sovereign capability. So having the opportunity to rebuild manufacturing and again, uh, places in regional Queensland were at the forefront of that. Of that. I, was, I was in Townsville today with Brendan O'Connor and we made a biofuels announcement there. So it just shows you where we're, we're understanding the traditional industries in Queensland, but we're looking to value add to that so that we can actually get the next generation of workers in regional Queensland the jobs that they deserve. All right, let's bring it over to Matt Canavan. And I know in your election an analysis from three years ago, Matt Canavan, you dwelt a lot on Bob Brown and his caravan coming through uh, the central and northern parts of your state. That hasn't happened this time around. In fact, quite the opposite. The Greens <laughs> are talking very confidently about possible lower house gains in seats like Griffith. Um, so that would be a, a net set setback for you, wouldn't it, that uh, that particular experiment wasn't repeated? Well, uh, Greg, um, good to join you and Anthony, uh, and Bob's always welcome back here. He's still got huge fans up here in central Queensland. He got 2,000 jobs, helped get 2,000 jobs going at the Adani mine there. That's happening, thanks to this government. Uh, the Labor Party we're, we didn't support it the last election, uh, but the mine is going, and thank God for the world that is going, because coal prices are through the roof. Uh, and there's just not enough coal around. Indeed, I met a guy called Ryan at the Claremont mine this morning, and you know he's trucking in coal fines that are just uh, in piles left over from old coal mines. They're reprocessing those because there's just not enough coal for our meatworks right now around Australia. And so we support these industries. In terms of vision, I'm up here in Moranbar, and we're going to build the Urana Dam just north of here in Collinsville. That's going to supply water uh, to Moranbar to the people here. That's been an issue. It's also going to open up massive amounts of agricultural land there around Collinsville, bringing in farming jobs. What about jobs, your coal-fired uh, power station region. from and last time, Matt? What about well, the I continue to fight for that, Anthony. I wish time. I'd get your support, mate. I, well, I wish the, I'd have other people's support. If I had your support, you, if I had others, we might, be able, to get, last we might time. be able to get that happen. Well, Anthony, well, the thing you went is, around mate, promising the thing is, I always last fight. Time and you I don't delivered. always win. You haven't right. delivered. Well, let's, I don't let's always let Matt finish off that thought, Anthony. We'll let him finish off and then you can rejoin. Thank 
Uh, Anthony, I don't always have a victory, mate, but the difference between you and me is I stand up for the regional areas, right? You would know what you were missing last election when Bob Brown was up here, when Bill Shorten said he didn't support the Adani project. I know you disagree with him in your heart of hearts, but you did nothing to help. You sat back. Right? And few of us that, that are up here in the LNP and Michelle Landry, we actually fought for the industry, fought for these jobs and delivered results. And all you can, all I'll promise the people of Queensland if re-elected is I'll continue to fight for them and fight for their jobs. I cannot guarantee victory, but I can guarantee that I will fight. That's what I will do because this is a great state with great opportunities and we've got a lot more to go. At this election, the Labor Party are proposing to put a new carbon tax on all the coal mines up here. Yeah, there just it goes as they're again. making so much money, again. just as things are going well. Always got, uh, always that is, is going to be a handbrake on our opportunities and our development. OK, well, that may or may not... Joel, I think it's probably a carbon tax, pass, mate. Your own, your own people call it a carbon tax. The fact check. Anyway, well, we won't run a fact check over well, that particular Joel claim, but we will, let, it's a carbon tax. we will let Anthony, we will let Anthony Chisholm respond to that point. I suppose the broader question, Anthony, is, you know, is there any residual uh, distrust in coal-heavy seats uh, towards Labor, which does have a higher emissions reduction target. Well, the, the three things you need to know about, Matt, is that it's a scare campaign, it's a scare campaign, and it's a scare campaign. There is zero substance to what he is claiming. Uh, he ran a scare campaign last time, he's trying the same thing again. Uh, I've been through two coal mines in the last couple of weeks, one in Moranbar, one in Blackwater, uh, both with hundreds of employees. Uh, neither the management nor the workforce when I was out on the ground um, raised this issue with me. Um, the fact of the matter is Matt is running a lone wolf style scare campaign. His own local member, Michelle Landry, National Party member, told him to pull his head in. David Littleproud, a cabinet mem member, National Party member, told him to pull his head in. A former cabinet mem member um, down in Melbourne Again, told him mate, to pull his head in. Again, mate, that's the difference. And a former leader I don't mind, having, I don't mind actually standing up for what I believe in. in. So you Matt don't. is out on his you own. Don't, mate. He's you running don't. a scare you're, campaign. You're quite as a There's mouse. zero substance to it. <laughs> Uh, and the Queensland people are seeing through it, which All is right. the most important well, thing. Well, you're certainly right, Anthony Chisholm. There was a bit well, of blowback said, for Greg, Matt Cannavan after that. Well, as I said, Greg, if I can just have a right of reply No net zero comment. Go, go ahead, and then we'll Greg. move on to some housing. Go on, Matt. Yeah, sure, mate. Well, well, Joel Fitzgibbon called the Labor Party's policy a carbon tax. So uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Anthony Chisholm there is calling a scare campaign, it's just the truth. It's just the absolute truth. All They've right. got a hit list of 215 businesses. Don't just include the mines. <laughs> yes. They include the uh, our major policy. heavy manufacturing. Yep. So we just hear Anthony Chisholm crap on about manufacturing. He's going to put a carbon tax on the smelters well, and refineries of Gladstone. It's How called a safeguards, it's the called the safeguards I've been mechanism. Both of those. I've been through right. the smelter and the refinery in the last 12 months and neither of them raced it with me. All right. It's oh, called yeah, the yeah, safeguards and mechanism the and it is going to be used by both parties to greater or lesser degree. So let's move on. Just finally, we know that South East Queensland in particular is the real growth belt of Australia as far as population is concerned at the moment. Uh, Anthony Chisholm, because housing affordability therefore is such a key issue, how can you be so certain that young families wouldn't, if they had a sufficient super kitty, want to dip into it? Uh, because they don't want to rob themselves of a good retirement uh, is the key reason and Australians know that's why the superannuation system has been set up uh, so that it can look after them and that they can hopefully have a comfortable retirement. Um, this thought bubble from the Prime Minister that's been um, put forward numerous times by the Conservatives over numerous years and has been rejected and canned uh, by senior ministers at the time it shows you how desperate they are with just six days to go before the election on Sunday. They announced this policy. It's been rightly panned from uh, everything I have seen. And Australians shouldn't have to decide, and young Australians shouldn't have to decide between a decent retirement and an affordable house. Yep, Matt, and that's not what the Labor Party proposition is. Matt Canavan, uh, you've got all sorts of pressures on prices there. Materials, flood cleanup, and just the you know, general pressure that is uh, common across all housing markets. Uh, because Jane Hume and others have told us, at least in the short term, this policy could exacerbate that problem. It's a difficult sell, I will put to you. Well, it's not going to have a material effect because there's just not enough first-home buyers in the market. The market, the housing market, seven hundred billion, sorry, seventy billion dollars. It's not it's seven million dollars. Sorry, it's not a big enough for the first first-home buyers to have that sort of impact. I mean, it's personal for me because I know when I was trying to start a family and buy my own house, it was incredibly difficult, and I was quite resentful of the fact that nine and a half percent of my savings at the time would just be locked up, and I couldn't use them for. Uh, for 40 odd years and that just seemed insane. I mean the, the most important investment you can make as a young person is in your own home, is in starting a family in that home and why shouldn't we allow people keep 
some of the money that, that they earn, the hard work that the men and women here do, uh, you know, that they, they have any actually to told you? I'm just curious. Have any actually home, told you they home. would they would dip in if they had the opportunity next year under a re-elected government? I've had a, not not here today at Moranbar, but I've had a number of discussions yesterday in Emerald and Blackwater with people about this, and there is a lot of uh, excitement about it because it is tough right now for young people to get ahead. And, and this is a very, a very useful investment. It's, you can invest right now, you can invest your superannuation in investment property. You can set up a self-managed super fund and invest it in someone else's home. Why can't you invest it in your own home to have your own kids and have your own family? The only reason the Labor Party are opposed to this is because the big banks and the financial institutions love to have your money locked up outside of your own home in their own investments and the Labor Party gets a lot of benefit from that so that's why they're for it but I think it's your money and you should you should be able to decide how you invest it. Yep quick right of reply you're obviously going to be a very strong defender of super Anthony Chisholm uh, what about also you know the help to buy scheme from the Labor side uh, it's another form of government intervention limited to 10,000 people but uh, some economists have suggested all these schemes would put upward pressure on prices. I think the difference is the Labor scheme is very targeted at 10,000 people per year, whereas this one is just cut lunch. So you don't actually know how many people could take this up, and I think that's the yes, risk not of help many driving house prices up, uh, which, is the, which is what really concerns me about it. So I, I understand young Australians wanting to get into the housing market. It's one of the proudest moments uh, my wife and I have had is buying our first house because my parents were mm. never able to do it themselves. So I understand that it is something there, but a thought bubble from the Prime Minister that's been rightly canned by numerous ministers over uh, numerous years uh, isn't the solution to a complex problem like this. All right, gentlemen, well, you do have your own campaigns to wage as well, well as helping others in the lower house. I'm sure we won't speak to either before Election Day. So thanks again for joining us today, at least, on Afternoon Briefing. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. OK, so, yeah, a bit coming up on the economic front in the remaining two... Well, we've got three days remaining this week, but over the next two days, Fran, we're looking forward to uh, some wage index figures tomorrow and then the all-important unemployment data. I think the government in particular might be sweating on that, hoping that finally, eventually, it may have a... A three in front of it. Yeah, and if it does, it's perfect timing. Like we've said before, you know, things come into an election campaign that you have no control of sometimes. Sometimes it's good luck, sometimes it's bad luck. The government got an interest rate rise, not so good luck. If they get uh, unemployment number with a three in front of it, Greg, they'll be, um, they'll take that, I think, in the last two days of this campaign. I think we're going to see also a lot of tests, a lot of polling coming out, Greg. There's a lot of seat polls coming out. Now, they're generally fairly unreliable. I noticed that 10 News tonight says they've got some unauthorised leaked Liberal polling, which I understand is going to show trouble for the government in Bennelong and the result closer than we might be thinking in Warringah, where the captain's pick candidate of Catherine Deves is campaigning. So there's going to be a lot of this tomorrow on the program. We'll try and gather some pulses together to see what it all adds up to, if they can take an overall look at that. No, that'd be great to do, because some of this stuff really, you know, piques the interest or whets the appetite. But, yeah, I think there are some real quality control questions over some of them, uh, including one we haven't even mentioned today, Fran, but could very, very briefly, the seat of Fowler. I mean, is there any suggestion here as you understand it that Christina Keneally uh, might be in trouble there? Well, I, ch I checked in in Fowler. I can't see any nervousness in the Labor camp, so that might be one which is not reliable. Certainly, Labor's not putting that in their camp in their camp of you know things to worry about. Yeah, well, <laughs> they I'm sure they've got plenty to worry about. Maybe not the seat of Fowler. Uh, let's see what tomorrow brings. Frank, that's see it for us today on Afternoon. Break. This election, it's easy to get lost amongst the polls, policies and pledges. Time's running out for you to know where you stand on the political spectrum. Go online to Vote Compass, answer a few